Right then, back with episode 29 of the Midnight Pod. Fucking hell, we've reached that pretty quick. We have Connor Martin, um, Northern Irish fella who can introduce himself in a second, um, put in touch with me by the guys that saw Ollie and Joe. Three different econ brands and a 3PO and you're 26. 26, yes. Yeah, it's a Don't lot look of shit 26 now, but... <laughs> do you think you look older or younger? Older. Yeah, I think you probably <laughs> do look older. It's probably all the fucking stress, I imagine. Uh-huh. Um, but yeah, I guess there's a load of shit we can dive into. I, I was just saying beforehand, before we start recording, I've never met someone that's set up a 3PL, certainly not someone that's in their 20s. It's not <laughs> something that would appeal to me. It's but boring. obviously, it's, it's like a super important part of econ brands and shit that no one really talks about because they just want to talk about spending money on ads and yeah. revenue, et cetera, et cetera. But... I'm sure there's a fucking interesting story and loads of shit we can go over to. I guess the first question as usual is just, who are you? What's your background? I genuinely run things pretty chronologically. So maybe kind of go back to where all this shit started and go right back to, to school. Them. Right back to school. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think so standard, stuff. standard uh, e-com school suites. I think if you didn't sell suites in school, you were uh, irrelevant <laughs> Yeah, sort of thing. So selling suites in school, uh, started very young. Um, secondary school same sort of thing me and my friend group weren't really <coughs> successful on paper um, sort of just doing the bare minimum to get by always had it in my head from back then that I wanted to be a millionaire obviously yeah. that's the bog standard sort of what you want to do when you're going going through secondary school um, and yeah sort of just sprung from there went to uni went to university in Liverpool with my girlfriend at the time Um doing criminal justice which was completely irrelevant um, and yeah. I think I went went for a second year broke up with a girlfriend then and sort of went into a spiral went into full time work worked for a phone company um, one of the better known ones uh, sort of getting into selling um, I think <coughs> sort of went everything I'd done I wanted to be the best at so um, whether it be selling be just before sorry going back just before um, worked in the phone shop I worked for Domino's Pizza and I sort of really found there what hard work really was. Mm. Like we were, I was sitting, I was that guy that took the pizzas out of the oven. Oven's 230 degrees. Yeah. So you know. he used to go with sweat patches after a fucking 14 hour shift. It was hell. Was um, this after uni or before? Or during? During, during, mm. yeah. Right. Um, started off as a delivery driver and crashed twice on the job. Uh, <laughs> realized that wasn't for me. Um, yeah. Then went inside done that for two years throughout uni um, and yeah then went to the phone company uh, went full time in the Christmas during my last year and um, yeah just sort of fucked uni off after that I still managed to get a pass um, I think I handed in a 2000 word dissertation and uh, managed to get a pass at uni never used it at all yeah um, then met my now wife um, during that Your time wife yeah wife Shit. married as well 26 <laughs> met her um, and got into crippling debt really bad sort of like 30,000 worth of debt mm-hmm. um, or just off stupid shit just living above not, nothing to show for it living above your means new iPhone every year um, working in a phone shop that sort of came is what you had to get but you still paid for it and that was a sort of hidden yeah. hidden one um, then because we were big, we were both sort of we were both in fucking so much debt. We moved, so we moved back home, live with my parents for a bit. What um, job were you doing? Sorry, after uni, did you get? Like a I was grad still, job? I was no, 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 I was still in the phone company. Um, right. So I went full time phone company in the January. Um, I don't know what year, twenty seventeen, say. Um, yeah. And then six months, six months, I went from twenty five hour temp to assistant manager. Um, moved back home, got an assistant manager job, then moved to manager within two months. Um, And then another further two months, I was helping with the whole commercial side of the business in in Northern Ireland. Obviously, when you're, what that was when I was 22, when you're 22 doing that, you're not getting paid for it. You're doing Mm -hmm. it for um, a bit of uh, clout sort of thing. Um, Yeah, and then during that time, I was doing like 60 hour weeks. I was working in what would be the equivalent to, say, Birmingham from here. Yeah. So the travel time is fucking huge. It was a full time job itself. and then during the travel was when I, I sort of burst the first Econ brand, which was the Essence Vault um, designer perfume um, inspiration company, um, shall we call it. Um, done that spare time. First two years of it wasn't really, it was It was just no, e- no Econ whatsoever. Um, I didn't even know what Econ was, didn't know what Shopify was. 
Um, it was just all selling at shitty markets. Uh, I say yeah. shitty markets, they fucking made the brand, so they're not shitty. Yeah. Um, it was really, in an e-com space, it would be called product development. I knew what worked, I knew what didn't. If I showed you the branding back then, it was so bad. Um, but yeah, and then things sort of turned sour at the phone company. Um, police were involved and stuff. Um, basically got shoved out of the position. Um, and I was about to go full time with the Essence Vault. Sort of had the fluttering moment where he thought, oh shit, this could, could fall on its face. Mm. I took a job at um, uh, yell.com. Um, oh, yeah. I'm sure you've been pestered with them if you signed up. Uh, yeah. I was one of them guys fucking calling builders during their job that didn't want to speak to me, getting told fuck off six, seven times a day. Done that for three months. I honestly I was there three months and that was that was been my best employment. They I was there I was there three months, not even, I think I was there two months. The third month, my mum was quite sick at the time. I spoke to my manager and I said, Look, my mum's quite sick, I'm gonna have to gonna have to pack it in. The essence fault was just about doing my monthly wage. Um so I just said, look, I need to, I need to spend some time with her, sort of thing. Um, and my manager just said, it was literally, it was a, like a call center. Basically, that's all it was, was a call center. Mm. Manager pulled me into this room and just said, Connor, walk out the door and just don't go back to your desk, walk out the door and uh, we'll forget this happened. And, I'm, and they still paid me for like two months after. So that really fucking set me up. They paid me two months. I was gone, didn't do an inch of work. Mm. And they paid me full, full monthly wage for two months. And that made that made the essence fault, to be honest, because I didn't have to worry about money, and I was just able to test things. Um, yeah, and then ever f- since then, that was that was the six months before COVID hit in the March. This was the June previous to mm. that, so that's that's only how long I've been in the space. Um, yeah, not that long. Ever since then, sort of sixty percent up, seventy percent up, sort of thing. Um, went full ecom in the September. Um, yeah, and just drove from there, really. So how long were you working on the Essence Vault before going full-time? Before going full-time, I would say just under two years. Call it 18 months. Um, I wouldn't say working on the Essence Vault was the project, but it was never, it was just, I had it in my head. I'm not going to do this forever. I just want to learn Ecom. Yeah. I want to learn DTC. Um, I didn't know what DTC was back then. Um Lucky enough, fell on to Shopify through a YouTube video, um, toyed with the theme, uh, and built the first version. First version, which was um, terrible. I think I got one sale in about six months. Um, yeah, that was so. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say working on the Essence Vault. Working on the Essence Vault, so to say, I would say three months before I went full time. It was that quick. It was yeah. the April, the April time. Sorry, we. Um, I seen it. I think I seen a few um, influencer ads, and I thought, "Fuck it! What if I send them free product? What's the worst that can happen?" And I, I, it was so funny. I still remember the girl's name. It was a girl. It was a Mrs. Hinch wannabe called Sophie. Uh, I, I sent her no, sorry, called Charlotte. Um, I sent her a thirty mil ball. The cost and frost was just like fucking a fiver, mm. um, and we made two hundred and fifty quid off it. I remember I was in bed with my missus at half eleven at night. And my phone started. I still had the Shopify, yeah. the, the the Shopify notification yeah, on. Classic. Um, and I was like, "What the fuck's happened? Some this is a scam." Like it was just seal, 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 seal. And she posted it like fucking ten. Um, mm. And I was, I, I, I still, I didn't. It was that bad. I didn't even remember I sent it to her. Um, and it just popped off. And it was from then. I just, I literally, I, I remember lying in bed, and I was like, "Fuck, this is it. This is what I'm gonna do." And I sort of just grew from there. So, so what was like the logic prior to that? Like, it's kind of it's quite niche and it sounds quite complicated. At least from my perspective, to start a perfume yeah. brand as your first ever econ venture. Do you know what's funny? Especially when, when you had no intention of sticking yeah, with it. It's, it's funny when people ask you that because you sort of make up your story. I think mm. you know you know yourself doing yeah, the yeah, neon yeah. signs and stuff. You, you tend. Yeah. Well, I, I know for me, I find myself making up a, making up a story. And what that story was, I was at uni, and one of my flat, one of my flatmates was a chemistry student, and that he was really into perfumes and stuff and I learned off him that's bullshit yeah, I, I, right. I literally halfway through I kind of thought do you know what I, I've always loved perfume I actually now thinking back I remember mixing perfume mixing my dad's shitty fucking dupe and yeah. uh, that sort of stuff and I was mixing it together and creating a new perfume and spreading it on myself uh, 
so I, I've, I've just oh, I've always loved perfume and I never understood why then big companies can get away with spending or um, making it cost two, three hundred pounds like, I find that fucking insane yeah um, still pay for it yeah still pay for it and plenty of people still do uh, yeah so that's that's sort of it how do you even start that like particularly with little money that you're saying that like, you work in the job obviously you got the two months paid which yeah. helped start it um, so you, was that just like you put a few grand into stock on a whim or what like what was the logic so before I left obviously I was on the market and stuff um, trying to get trying to get um, uh, the sort of product right mm. and I tried so many things What I, literally if you tr- if you look up on YouTube how to make perfume every single one of them videos is wrong and I, I now thinking back it's purposely wrong Yo, fellas, quick one. First bit of promo for the pod. You may or may not have heard, I released a fucking e-com course a few months ago. Basically spent like six months making it because I was in between businesses, as you probably know, if you follow my shit. I must say, 12 hours long, it's fucking quality content. I was gonna drop it at like 1,500 quid with some bullshit guru-y webinar and all that rubbish, but as you know, it's not my main thing. I'm working on a new brand right now, very, very fucking much in the trenches, which is why I think it's actually a better course than everything else out there, because it's built on real experience of my brands in the past and my current one. I think it's super, super valuable. If you're interested in e-com, you're already in e-com, and you want it to get into e-com, zero to one, starting a brand from scratch, then definitely worth investing in. Link is in the bio of this video, or podcast, Spotify, Apple Music, wherever the fuck you're listening or watching, and enjoy the rest of the pod. And um, they tell you to mix it with the wrong stuff. Um one wrong quantities and perfume's dangerous perfume can like be unsafe to use uh, and I've, I literally I found a blog um, it's old like 2008 blog from America and it showed you this sort of vague description um, and I bought stuff based off that and got it and I just went holy shit this is quite good well, so you made it yourself we made it we made it from scratch ourselves yeah what, in, in the kitchen, like? I, I'll show you a video, a picture. I had a, a fucking flat kitchen smaller than yours. Yeah. Um, in here. Probably cleaner. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> and it actually wasn't. Um, and I made the first batch there. That back then, it was more of a focus on wax melts and candles, mm. which is a bit more kitchen-esque, uh, shall we call it. Um, we done perfumes. We didn't really do that many perfumes because everyone, everyone and their fucking mum had a, a candle business. Yeah. Um, it's definitely on Instagram that Instagram prime time um, so we wanted to focus on that and then it was the markets that sort of I was at the markets and people I had this big bit of wax melts and candles um, and perfumes on the side and people were more interested oh, so you started selling in physical like stalls. yeah physical market stalls yeah like old school yeah, yeah, yeah very old school so yeah. when was this like 2018 this would have been oh, co- co- going that. back which 2019 would be COVID uh, so 2018 market stalls yeah and then when did you entirely switch to online? Would have been the... Is that when you went full time? Yeah, would have been the September before COVID. Right. And when was there a point where it, you suddenly thought, fuck, this is like a, can be a serious business? It would have been the next month, October. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And was yeah. that organically or through paid ads? Uh, How do you scale it? And, I don't and, know. and were you still making it? I'm fucking surprised. You're still making it from your yeah. kitchen at this point? Or no, what? no, no. So um, September... <laughs> The markets were getting that big. We, I literally, we've moved premises seven times. We've moved from my spare bedroom, the kitchen to the spare bedroom, to my, one of my dad's spare bedrooms, which was slightly bigger. Then we rented a few office blocks, and off three office rooms, um, one office room and two, then three. Moved into a bigger building. Um, then the landlord there, there gave us one of the back rooms, and it was filled with shit, like filled with rubbish and you know, we, we sort of said, look, if we help you clear out, can we have the space? He said, yes. Um, and then we moved into where our premises is now, which so happened to be one of my my father's old businesses, which was an indoor um, uh, artificial grass football pitch. Um, so he sold that up because of COVID. Uh, mm-hmm. And I moved into that building and that's, we sort of grew it from there. And where's everything made now? It's still in the same in that warehouse. Oh shit! So you're yeah. not making it in China. No, 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 no. I just assume you got some supplier of Alibaba. No, so if you make any cosmetics in China, it can't be vegan friendly. It has to be tested on. Oh, sorry, it can't be cruelty free. It has to be tested on animals. Right. If you make any, any uh, I could be wrong here, so correct me if I'm wrong. But any cosmetics that are made, manufactured in China, are tested on animals. That's one of their sort of cosmetic um, rules, mm. so to speak. So at the time coming from a background of all of our influencers were based on Mrs Hinch cruelty free was the the big thing it was the had to be cruelty free yeah um yeah 
So st- that's why we never, that's why China was never an option for us. And what does that business look like now in terms of like amount of people, scale? Yeah, so we've got how it's been run. Um, 75 staff um, on payroll, full timers between 40 and 50. Um, oh shit, for the, for the essence vault yeah when so we come on to the 3PL yeah. so with the 3PL uh, I'll talk about it it's, it's shared staff right, so okay. it's the yeah, yeah, yeah. the dispatch the dispatch part of the essence vault feeds it, the dispatch part of that okay. which was the essence vault is now the 3PL right <clears throat> yeah because <laughs> there's, there's a lot of different things here because yeah I, I guess we'll come back to 3PL in a minute then but um, so 75 staff mm-hmm Making everything in house. Making everything in house. So How many SKUs like on the website? Because it seems like a pretty fucking complicated. We sell to run. about two hundred different fragrances in three different sizes. So six hundred SKUs. Yeah, six hundred SKUs at least. I'd probably say closer to a thousand. It's all made in house. All made in house, yeah. And is it like made to order or what? Um, not so much made to order. Um, so say for example, this Friday every quarter we do a buy one get one free, which and shit goes fucking crazy. Um, yeah. It's like renowned amongst the community. Um, then it will sort of be made to order because we're shipping out stock that fast. Mm. But we do tend to keep, we try and keep about 100, 200 bottles of each skew. Right. But obviously with that amount of skews, it's hard. Yeah, fucking hell. That's like, what, 60, 100,000 mm. units at a time. And then like, customer acquisition, I, I assume that's paid strategy, is it? Like, All paid what strategy. What's worked best? Yeah, what's worked best? Um, <laughs> Fuck, I'm thinking back to at the start when we used Kit. Remember Kit? Yeah, Kit. Yeah, I was, oh I was my a scam. god, um, that was twenty rolls for us every time. Really? Yeah, right from twenty pound to two hundred. At that time, two hundred pound a day. Like, you know, well, yeah, in twenty twenty when Facebook ads were just oh, a joke. Yeah, I missed um, that time. insane. Uh, and then we switched to Magics. Remember? Have you heard of Magics? Yeah, and yeah, we done that, and that was insane for us. That's when we started the fucking scale. That's what like an AI scaling platform basically. Um, it's Magic with an X, right? Yeah, I think they do everything though. Like uh, audience builder, um, uh, bidding strategies and stuff. But for what we done, we we literally just picked a few AI audiences. I don't know, is it AI or is it just their their fancy terminology for it? Um, Make it sound very simple. Don't know, but fucking whatever it is. At, at the time, it worked for us. It was massive for us. Um, we started to scale, um, spend. Uh, Magic's at that time. At that time of the business, it, it scaled us single handedly. Like so you weren't even. Wait, so you weren't running any of it by like manually mm. or with an agency? No. Purely just software? No. At that time, no. And how much were you spending just with that? I can I would say maybe four hundred pound a day, five hundred pound a day. If yeah. that if that. Probably even less actually. Two hundred pound a day. Um but we were getting quite good ROAS. Yeah, yeah. So how is that scaled now? Like how many orders are you doing now? We're doing per day we're doing about seven hundred orders. Oh, fuck. Um, but buy one get one free could, it could go from um, the AV is what 35 quid 35 quid yeah so 600 grand a month give or take yeah it's a big boost um, yeah um, I just clocked I think you're the first person that's actually disclosed numbers on this podcast yeah. uh, he tricked it out of me yeah um, tricked it out no, of no, me no. exactly do you know, you know why I'm, ha- I'm okay to give them numbers is because everyone's happy to share Shopify screenshots on Twitter or, yeah. and no one fucking says the reason why I've never done it is because them numbers mean jack shit I could do um, I'll talk about this in a bit but uh, I could do a million month a million pound a month and be broke and do 600 pound or 600 thousand and be mega profitable 100% tell me about it Neon Beach <laughs> <laughs> yeah well yeah put massively. it to like 1.5 mil a month and then massively. it broke yeah and yeah. I would have been better off doing a quarter of that yeah uh, it's not many people think that. I think it's sort it's starting to be more relatively known on amongst that sort of Twitter, Twitter, um, D to C app. Yeah, yeah I feel like the whole D to C world is, as it's been proven, it's just such a small world. Like the yeah. whole ecom entrepreneur sphere, whether it's Twitter, well, I guess mainly Twitter, but like Twitter, YouTube, events, all this shit. Everyone knows everyone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, literally. Because there's about I swear like zero point zero one percent of the world yeah. are in it. Some <laughs> shit. And the just the first other. world, like. Yeah, um, watch this. Yeah, but on that, like we were, we were scaling very heavily, um, and we were with an agent, a very well known agency. Uh, they know who they are, and they, do you know what? See, thinking back, they were brilliant. If we had things like triple wheel back then, they'd still be managing us mm. because they were, they were great. Uh, I don't think you'd want me to mention, so I'm not going to. Um, but we were fucking, we were nearly bankrupt. I, don't, I haven't really spoken about this to anyone. 
but we were this was Black Friday the year we moved into the big warehouse so we had to pay for the warehouse the 2020 yeah um, we were a new brand so you're not getting any finance first year did you see not yeah. massive finance anyway so we had not like I mean when I say finance I mean old fashioned finance like banks mortgages things like that you're not getting any sort of finance yeah um, Danny Daniel go to Wayfly shout out to Wayfly yeah <laughs> um, Ross if you're listening um, you know so we were nearly bankrupt and we were we were maybe £50,000 away from bankruptcy um, yeah it was a tough time and we were scaling heavy so Do why was that cash flow issues or not being profitable not being profitable because um, this is sort of shit no one speaks about it, is, it isn't and, and like the whole Twitter sphere like you're saying so it's just screenshot 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 what people don't understand is right so end. you've got oh my brands and this is even in the in the, um, the venture capitalist sort of yeah point of view as well oh you're not growing 50% month, month over month why why aren't you yeah. You know, we're in this sort of age. If you're going 50% month on month, you have to buy your stock at about a 250% rate based on the, your last order. Mm. To, you have to buy, so you've got the 100% that you've used, the 50% that you've got to cover you. Yeah. And now your next purchase you're not going to get for maybe eight weeks. So that's another 100% growth on top of what you're already doing. So that's massive fucking money. That's massive money. Yeah, to be fair, like, fuck. There's a, that that is a whole interesting debate in itself like the whole revenue and growth and valuation and VC funding blah 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 versus profit profit like that, yeah. that good old thing which yeah maybe we can come on to that in more detail later but yeah I think it's a super interesting debate because yeah you are right like there's a, I think there's definitely a bit of a bubble in like venture capital and funded yeah. D2C brands like look at shit like Casper mattresses yeah that I think they raised more than they've ever done in revenue or something and now they're like yeah they went from I don't know I don't know the numbers layman's terms like they went from being a three billion dollar company to now being worth like 50 million yeah on paper yeah but they got a lot of and they've never made any money yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but they were banked by like SoftBank and shit yeah it's, de it's definitely it's, uns it's like the unspoken sort of commandments of DTC is scale ever is such a sexy word yeah. on paper um, that uh, definitely near Brookus we dropped that agency um, in the January we had our worst month in about six seven months in the February but it was our most profit profitable it was more profitable than the than so you were just overspending previously not so much overspending like we our AOV was 20 23 pound yeah, 24 pound so we well, and we offered free shipping back then um, and I literally said to myself Look, I don't I'm not making money on people buying a sample as part of the customer journey I get it but we're not making money on you LTV I was too naive to know what LTV even meant mm. um, so we, we put our um, I'm trying to think of it uh, it was um, I don't know I think it was on an agency call and they talked about your AOV blah blah and I thought fuck I'm just going to raise my um, free shipping threshold 40 quid and fuck it I'm going to really yeah. go and, and it fucking destroyed us our conversion dropped from 4% to like 1.9 um, and I, I thought I'm, I, and it's hard because initially you think straight away I've got at that time I think we had 30 staff he was I'm going to have to let 20 people go because our sales are falling are dropping like mm. fucking shit um, uh, yeah so it was definitely a hard time but we we, ran, we rode that them through months we actually started working with um, at that time the February we started working with Savannah Sanchez on oh, TikTok yeah. we worked with her for we still get creatives from her um, and they're brilliant uh, but we, she ran our paid spend for two months across everything no just across TikTok across TikTok um, and we scaled pretty heavy we spent more um, she's going to ask me can she take them back over we spent more that month than we haven't we've spent even today scale wise mm. um, she did very well for us uh, um, but that sort of that was the moving tide because then the existing customer base now realised okay the 40 the forty pound threshold is now staying so they, they initially they held back and it's not something I thought of but they held back on ordering on ordering um, because they, they thought it was only something that I was testing mm. and then eventually once because of TikTok sort of took the, the bad parts away AOV rose to what it is now 35, 36 um, yeah. and that saved the business definitely saved the business massively and when was that 
Start of 2021. So it was the start of, um, start of 2021, yeah, February 2021. January, we, cha- we changed it in January. End of January, we changed it. Um, and then middle of Feb, um, Facebook started picking up again. Savannah spent, Savannah spent sort of covered, I still think her spend on TikTok replicated what we, what the results on Facebook and it made the Facebook results better because you're all oh, that bullshit about the algorithm more mm. more buyers were coming to the site and um, Facebook had more like we went because of how cheap the TikTok traffic was we were going from like let's say I don't know the numbers exactly we say 5,000 visitors a day to 15,000 visitors a day conversion rate dropped but there was yeah. a shit ton of visitors sort of thing um, yeah and then ever since then it's been a lot more stable so to speak um, yeah, so. massive learning curve massive learning curve because initially you look at all of the DTC gurus and they're like oh scale 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 this use this hack to get 200% um, that nearly crippled us because I was doing every single fucking hack I found yeah spend more grow more me. yeah right so you mentioned before obviously building a fucking massive perfume brand aside for a second there's loads of the shit you do which is mad you said there's two other econ brands two other econ brands you have or are involved with or what's the story with those believe it or not um, it was your tweet your twitter thread the first one you done really on Neon Beach that fucking opened my eyes massively because and I actually it was only in the fucking flight over here that I realised that's actually what it was you tweeted about obviously your sort of shit um, and I thought fuck I need to diversify I can't focus everything on one brand. It's not healthy. Well, you, you drew that from my tweet. From I, your I would have tweet. said the main thing was I wasn't focused. Seriously, I I would have thought That's so more. Interesting. Um, I would have thought more on diversification because you were very unlucky not to take one of the brands with you through it. Yeah, although I mean, my heart wasn't really in, in either of them at the end, but yeah, yeah, it's interesting that. Yeah, so I I went from. One one sole focused um, brand, the Essence Vault. Now we're in supplements and skincare. Both brands aren't doing great, to be honest. They're not pulling numbers, but again, that's more down to focus. Um, but they but they will. I, I'm I'm very confident in the brands, so I know they will do well eventually. Um, but I just it was a big realization point that we we needed to diversify. Um, and we can't focus all our eggs in one basket because then like sorry another thing that came about that was because in August last not the year last year the year before we got hacked and they spent like 22,000 on our IMAX and uh, they who, lot, who hacked you? just some fucking can't hack me <laughs> and they paid for what? just they paid they ran like 22 grand in like Chinese fucking of, of, of ad spend? yeah ad spend um, ad spend and it took me what to their website? To their own page, yeah. From yeah. your ad account. From my ad account. From my ad account. So right, through my ad account, no. obviously yeah, yeah, Amex yeah. was spending it, um, and uh, yeah, and it was literally so they hacked me on the Monday. It was mad the way they done it. So they, they covered, they hacked for my personal account. They put ISIS shit on my profile, which that then meant Facebook wouldn't talk to me to get back ISIS into shit. it. Fucking hell, that's um, heavy. And uh, shout out to Nick Shackleford. He was the one that got me back in the account at the time. Uh, he reached out to his agency rep um, and then started the ball, ball rolling. I got the account back on the Friday. Like That's only five days, but fuck me, that destroyed me because I thought, oh my God. At that time, we were like 90% spend on Facebook, which I, that was 2020. Um, we were 90% spend on Facebook. Our orders went from like at the time, 400 a day, 400 a day to like 50 a day. Mm. and this yeah. isn't just like Been it's not like your 3PL where you can they just get less orders I had staff having to be sent home like I was still paying their wages and I'm sending them home at like 10am 10, 10 because they're fucking done they have no orders to pack do you know what I mean mm. um, so that was that I, I was shitting myself like again I didn't really show up much but I was fucking shitting myself because I just realised some fucker from um, he was Chinese uh, because uh, I, I eventually he friended me an hour before he hacked me um, so he bought my password did you not have two, uh, two factor authentication on I uh, fucking wish I did now no I turned it on straight yeah I'm biblical with that shit yeah. now like, anyone listening back please admins, turn it on now 2FA text um, I think Facebook's app. made it mandatory now yeah I mean anyone that spend any money put two factor authentication on and I've got a quick story actually similar to that and add another admin which I told you to do because four years ago right when I was back in the dropshipping days I was spending like 
would have been at least 10 grand a day on ads at one point. And I got locked out of my Facebook account, I think because I went to Barcelona and like some IP, whatever. Yes, yeah. And I didn't have a backup admin and like I couldn't get back into the account for like two weeks and I couldn't stop the spend. And right, the only way, yeah. and, and I, I knew it wasn't profitable because I could see it on the back end. <laughs> The only way to stop the spend, I had to call Amex at the time and say, cancel the entire Amex account. Because they said they can't, they can't block Facebook or some bullshit. And I was like, all right, cancel my Amex account. Yeah. That was the only way around it. And then ever since then, I have like, anyone listening, two-factor authentication <laughs> plus have like multiple backup admins on your BM. I think I, I got a Facebook notification. Which a lot of people don't have, surprisingly. No. I got a Facebook notification last week and it said, if you don't do this list, we're shutting, we're temporarily pausing your account. Yeah. So we're lucky enough, obviously, we already had it all on. I have like mad two-factor authentication just even on my personal Instagram account now. Mm. After all, like, I think all the actually shit that's I went how, through like last year. That's how they first of all got in, was through yeah. Instagram, Facebook. Um, I had, Obviously, I was a stupid fucker. I had the same password for everything. Um, yeah, I do, to be fair. Yeah. But... Uh, but no, so that between that and and that t- the your famous tweet, um, it sort of gave me the realization. Okay, I need to get I need to get a few different brands on the go. Um, not it's not so much I haven't just set these brands up willy nilly. Like they are brands that mean a lot to me. And when I say a lot to me, they've helped me in my daily life, which I think is the main focus of a brand. Mm. If it like you've got that obviously going with space goods. Yeah. Um, if they if they help you, you know they're going to help others. Mm, um, very true. Which is massive. Uh, but then, obviously, some came to me um, that okay, I've got three ecom brands. What happens if the ecom bubble bursts, or nah. do you know, like web web three Come fucking on. takes over and the ecom goes shit? So it's like right, okay, so three PL. Um, and the main realization in the three PL is, which a lot of other ecom brands, you need to have a look at your numbers and really think. What is the ninety percent of your business? It is the distribution side, like that is all of ecom. If if you don't, if you're not in control of your, if you don't have a good three PL or you're not in control of your distribution, your brand will fail. Yeah, just I, I, want, I want so much want to go into on, on the three PL because it's a really interesting mm-hmm. thing that you've just alluded to as well. But it's just right. Few things. It's interesting that you picked up from my Twitter thread, which, by the way, it's always funny when you put stuff online. <laughs> you never think about people actually, like real people, actually seeing it. Do yeah. you know what I mean? It's always just numbers. Same with like e-commerce a lot of ways. Mm. But you're saying you, like you should diversify, which I can see from what I put out. And yeah, it's just funny because I thought the biggest problem and what I'm trying to not do now and what I'm not doing now is I'm not diversifying because I want to focus on something. It's a double-edged sword. Definitely. But I guess within that focus, I can diversify in terms of like having different channels. Yeah. So I guess there's two ways of looking at it. But then also what you just said about like e-com potentially dying. Mm. Like, come on. I Like, I don't know because I'm a pessimist. I, I get that. Yeah, well, I, I can. I can, I can e-com will that. never die. E-com will never die. It sounds like your methodology to business is like, and correct me if I'm wrong, but like you'd rather definitely make five million than risk trying to make a hundred. Is it Sod's law? Everything that can go wrong will go wrong. Is that the same? Yeah, something like Is that. It some, yeah. Someone's law. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you listen to so many stories. Your name, your story. Can you say name beach? Is it your loud? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I talk about all the time. Uh, it's fucking loud. Yeah, I know you do. Um, that there, like that, was something that you never thought before that happened. That was going to happen. But my, like, with my business, something could happen that, that I never thought was going to happen. Mm. And that's the same with every business. Like you could have, um, I know for a jewelry business, uh, I know some really high influencer absolutely dishes your brand, your trust bag gets destroyed, your Facebook page score gets destroyed, your business is gone. Um, that can happen. And it has happened yeah. to plenty of people. So diversification is a massive thing. Now, yes, the, the main double-edged sword to that is, okay, so now I've got 90% of my revenue coming from my baby, which is the essence fault. Am I not given a hundred? It's the eighty twenty thing. Mm. I'm missing out on double on that or triple on that. Yeah, but as you said, I can definitely make a rather than pushing to B. And it's not so much not. I'm not pushing to B. I want to get to that stage, mm. that massive stage. But I'd rather do it across three or four different things. Do you know, say for example, I sell brand number three. Brilliant. That can help me push brand one and brand two again. Yeah. Um. 
Yeah. It's, it's, it, it, you could speak about it all night, really. Because yeah, it is. You I could, do find that difference in uh, actually interesting. There was, I think it was episode 24 with Matt Burgess from NBC Customs or whatever. Well, NB Customs. And we had a little debate about this kind of near the end of the episode. And it, he was like, do you invest in property? And I was like, no, I've never thought about anything other than getting filthy rich, building an e brand. <laughs> like literally. And it's still true. Yeah. It's a, but, and, it, and uh, yeah, I guess he's probably definitely more sensible. But like, where do you think that like pessimism comes from? Because obviously you're obviously not, I mean, I always say that I'm a cynical optimist, yeah. but you're obviously not a pessimist because you're a fucking entrepreneur and you've built stuff. Yeah. So like a real pessimist is like, fuck, don't even start. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So is it because you've had a little flavor of doing your own thing, having had like shit jobs in the past and now you're like, fuck, I don't want to have to go back to that or what? Where does it stem from? So it's them. I'm like a therapist. The big one that's them. I know, fucking hell, I'm covering shit. Um, my father, he, uh, serial entrepreneur, um, ADHD like myself. Uh, mm. Um, he, he started his he started his company in 2003, which was um, safety nets. So do you know like um, they're building a building? Um, so the fucking fucking hell, there's a business for everything. Yeah, the roofers no don't the about. roofers don't fall in when they're putting the roof on. Yeah. And he'd done safety nets on them. Um at the time, fucking huge. Um recession hit. So just before that he got he got offered um massive money, millions, for his for their him and his brother's business. Um he didn't take it. Um recession hit and it fucking wiped him out. Not wiped him out, he still fucking survived. Um and he never really talked about his struggles, but he was in the red for years. Mm. Um and I think that's where the pessimism comes from. That sort of fucking founding story. Um, that it can't just change like that. Um, so yeah, I think that's where the pessimism comes from. Where it can like anything can just like no one fucking thought a recession was coming. Yeah, but it stopped construct it stopped the construction straight cons- construction trade. Yeah, um, fucking from a hundred to ten. So and he it took him years and years to rebuild. So I think that's what my why I'm thinking to myself. Okay, shit, I need to really. Diversify. Um, I, when I say eighty twenty, when you say mention properties and stuff, my eighty twenty is ecom. I'm yeah. good at ecom. Why do I bother? Why would I bother in property when I can focus my top twenty percent in ecom? Yeah, yeah. Because that's <clears throat> what not so much what I'm good at, but it's what I've done before, um, sort of thing. And I, I to be honest, I bought a flat last year, and it's been the biggest fucking headache ever. I bought one flat, and um, it cost me it, it's cost me thousands. Um, what, to live in or is it no Manchester? so it was uh, do you know the Grenfell Towers yeah and so I bought one of them fucking flats in Manchester that had the the, oh, the cladding cladding issue I nearly bought a flat a year and a bit ago just over there mm-hmm. and I, I actually put a non-refundable deposit down and lost it because I pulled out of it when I, when I turned out it turned out I had some cladding issues and they weren't mm-hmm. the mortgage that was approved that took fucking months to get because I'm obviously self-employed and it was a ridiculously expensive flat anyway by the way this was just before shit went fucked up in Neon Beach but yeah, it turned out that I had like cladding issue and then actually 95% of the people that would have lent on it now wouldn't until it got something fixed. And it was yes. like, oh, uh, you, ha- you lose your, is it NSW or something? Yeah, yeah, You can yeah. get a mortgage. Yeah. If, yeah. if it hasn't got this certificate, that only so I'm many... I'm so glad I didn't do that anyway now, but... Yeah. I mean, yeah, that is the same sort of thing. So I bought it at auction thinking, okay, I'll buy it out. You have to buy it outright if it's auction so you can't get a mortgage. So I yeah. thought, oh, I'll just buy it outright and then... I'll mortgage it straight away and get the money back. I spoke to a mortgage advisor <laughs> a day after buying it. It's like Connor um, sent me a news article. I was like, did, did, were the, "Was this not disclosed on anything that this has got the gladness yeah. yet?" And I was like, "No." Look through the paperwork. Of course, it was fucking there. I never fucking seen it. Yeah. And um, fuckers sent me like a thirty-page document, and it was hidden on like page like twenty-eight. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, so that's that's my eighty twenty is focus on ecom. I, I know the I know the drawbacks. I know what the negatives that can happen. Um, diversification is my way of of trying to stop them happening. And as I said about um, with scaling difficulties in the perfume world, I won't have that with skincare. I won't have it with supplements. So it's open yeah. new avenues as well. Yeah, and no, I definitely see that. So, so the three PL then, because that was. <laughs> 
10 minutes before we started recording. That was the only business I thought you were involved <laughs> in, which just goes to show that I don't fucking do any research. I suppose that's the best way for a podcast. Yeah, it's just live and direct. So talk to me about that. Like, how did that start? Because that seems very fucking random to me. You were running econ brands like a lot of us in this space. And then you thought, I'll start at 3PL? Like, yeah, so me how- and- main thing was because I did look first of all I looked at my staff and thought and looked at it and goes okay 60% 70% of the staff is based on is, is based on dispatch um, mm. and I, was th- I thought to myself right okay so if we have a bad day I'm letting if we have a bad two months three months I'm letting 70% of my staff go that can't happen like, I, I don't just do it to make money I do it because I'm helping other people and they're helping me it's two way street um, yeah but I don't want to let them go if she hits the fan. So how can I, one, how can I help them? Two, how can they help me? And three, what, what at the end of the day, is the bulk of the business? And it was distribution. And we did, we went to a few um, different 3PLs. Um, and first 3PL was, was the biggest. Um, we went to them, guy in a suit, introduced us at the door, spoke to a girl in the suit, spoke to the fucking director who was also in a suit. And there was no... Yeah. Like you are representing DTC brands. Not one of you fuckers. Not one of us fuckers wear suits. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you've got sweats on. I've got a t-shirt on. This is like that's not the environment we should be in. And then got onto the pricing structure. They're like, okay, yes, Connor, we can give you a three pound an order, but it, that's only if you sell your products out in the one day, or mm. um, that's using Hermes, uh, which um, it's just and, complicated, yeah, right? Uh, yeah. And then the storage costs, and then they've got weight costs, import costs. Um, returns cost and then air cost yeah air right. cost you've got cost to breathe in the facility uh, some shit. pallet cost yeah. how many pallets you can bring in if you bring in more than 10 pallets uh, um, or if your products sit there for more than a week cost um, so yeah so we really looked at that and we thought right if what would I want if I was what, what did I want investing in the 3PL was especially having like fucking 800 SKUs I know that 20% of them SKUs aren't going to really sell yeah um but I don't want to. I don't want to have. I don't want the twenty percent of my lowest skews costing me the profit on the top twenty, sort of thing. So I thought, right. So how can we change this? Um. So we, we thought, okay. So a fixed fee. The land cost in Northern Ireland is so much cheaper than in the UK. So that wiped out the storage cost. Pardon me. So we didn't have to worry about, um, charging storage costs whatsoever because the way I think of it is, if a customer has given us all this stock that's helping pay for the mortgage on that building. Mm. So, and then the end goal is we've got a uh, £200,000 warehouse paid off because yeah. um, client A has his stock in it. Perfect. We've got that. That's That building's now ours. So technically, is it really something that we should be charging for? No, because they're paying a mortgage on that. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Um, so that's why we went for a 3PL because especially, the, sorry, Another reason we went for 3PL is because of fluctuations in sales. So, like, uh, say, for example, January is very quiet, um, whereas November is fucking mad. I looked, I looked at it as I can't, I can't really hire another 50 staff for seasonality based on just the essence. Well, what happens if fucking our website goes down on Black Friday? Not only is my staff out of work, I've hired 50 temps that could fucking pay double. Mm. So I, that I can't really do that because of the essence. Well, like, but if I if I had thirty different brands in, all them thirty brands aren't going to fail. Yeah. So I can hire to my heart's content, because the profit I'm making on the three PL clients can pay for the for the extra staff. If I get the staff wrong, I get less profit. Not, you know, not being let. So it goes from less profit to less co- or more cost, so to speak. Mm. So it's a win win. Um, one call I had with a client on three PL, they were like, okay, so you own three DTC brands. You're obviously going to focus on them. Um, you're obviously going to focus on them rather than my brands when you when it gets to the busy season. Yeah. Definitely not the case because. So it's all in the same. It's all in the place. same. So we it's all in the same in, uh, industrial estate, so to speak. We've got four different buildings, um, in that industrial estate, um, the main one, and then three storage units. Um, so it initially started from you are a brand owner, you are a three PL customer. Effectively, mm-hmm. everything else looks shit. This doesn't make sense. I'll start my own three PL. But then on top of that, it makes sense because, like you just said, it levels out the risk. Of it levels out the risk, yeah. And your brand's having a bad month or whatever. 
it's as you said before that we started recording no 3PL owner is below the age of 40 50 mm. do you know what I mean and no DTC owner is above the age of 30 yeah, 40 50 so true. it's a complete diversification like it's, it doesn't make sense so that's why we've done it um, and it's working very well for us we just hired our, our first account manager um, shout out to Melissa if you're listening um, she's brilliant very bubbly um, and the same sort of thing I completely changed the what I experienced with our 3PL visits was a sales manager that was fucking hounding you like a wolf yeah this um, Melissa has no experience and and she has a little experience in sales um, but she's more of a project, project manager which is what I would have wanted uh, for as an account manager at 3PL someone that I can trust to pick up the phone if uh, a customer from a few days ago says they haven't got their order that's going to be Melissa she's going to help she's going to put the arm around the client she's going to explain okay so um, this has happened or like something's went wrong we'll get it fixed don't worry um, whereas having a sales manager they're not they're just going to be focused on their next sale so how do you get your first clients for a 3PL that has no clients because I guess it's probably a little bit different to obviously starting an e-com brand because well, well it is because mm. the clients are obviously DLTV is way bigger yeah and there's less of them are you getting them through the same channels or what so currently we've got them more so from from me networking um, just uh, Facebook community Adelaide, Twitter Adelaide, yeah Twitter now yeah. so um, all in Joe have pushed a few our way as well uh, yeah but they generally. tried to push me or whatever. Well. That's how they mentioned you first, actually. <laughs> uh, we'll speak about that after. Yeah. Um, believe it or not, two the two big ones we work with uh, have came through Twitter or sorry TikTok ads. Um, looked at the ad, um, and there were ones an Australian brand, one is UK brand, and they were the UK brand was charging like a fucking seven quid for a shipment. Uh, LV or sorry um, my order was 15 quid and 7.99 for shipping mm. he's like what are you doing um, he was still shipping out of his garage uh, and raw mail costs for, for a normal person is very expensive um, yeah so we got no, him no on board yeah we got no drop that wine um, we got him on board um, and then the Australian company um, they they used um, a last they call it a last man service which is basically they send it over from Australia on a pallet and then it gets broken up and yeah. shipped um, last man for, with Roy Mail. Um, that takes like 10 days, 20 days. So that wasn't very viable for them. Mm. Um, so we helped them there. They, they're they only really shipping 50 orders a day. But the savings we're making them um, is massive because they were going from like fucking uh, like 17 Australian dollars to like 410 with us, which is our standard price is like 410, 420. Um, and that's a massive saving like, obviously as you know like to scale knowing that that fixed cost is the same is a big part of it yeah how the how the fuck do you figure out how to run a 3PO I, I believe every every DTC brand that does their own fulfilment is a 3PO technically they've got their warehouse the SKUs are there yeah yeah true uh, I guess D- did you have like I mean I've never even thought about doing my own fulfilment because couldn't think of anything worse than like having to be in a warehouse. Oh yeah, it's boring. It is boring work. It's repetitive work for the dispatch. Um, a three PL is more so a DTC brand crossed with a recruitment agency, sort of thing. Yeah, because the turn the not st- not staff turnover. Our staff turnover is extremely low, but we have to hire fast, um, and that can go wrong. Um, so the processes have to be in place. The processes have to be in place because a new packer to us still means we can't make mistakes with customers orders because they're mm. physical cost they're yeah. like your customers orders you have your product costs um to resend that out to a customer means you no longer get profit on that order so that needs to be fixed um but once you get over that barrier like every dtc brand basically is a 3pl yeah so like did you have like fancy fucking i don't know what they're called like when i went to visit james and james in the past and shit you know all, all these systems whatever that look like they cost like hundreds of thousands to like right. so I'm gonna this is fucking eye opening right so 90% of 3PLs all use a whitelisted service it's all the same service it's all the same software the entire same back end ne- all the what, same and back-end. they just obviously white label it to have <laughs> they, their own they, they is use, that why all these dashboards look the same exact same it's a, it's, I'm just gonna fucking say it it's a system called Mintsoft um, it costs like an extra £100 a month to whitelist it um, <laughs> that's funny uh, 
Yeah. Um, so I've just I've just gave away the three yeah, PL's biggest thing. Yeah, I've been on sales calls of like three PL's in the past few weeks, like I was saying before, and they all bang on about, about how food. unique their system is. And one thing I said was, "Oh, that looks like the yeah. previous system I've used." And they're yeah. like, "Are you sure?" They're saying yeah. that the only one that is bespoke is James and James. It was completely different than anyone else. Oh really? Yeah, yeah. I think their founders, um, they come from a software background. Yeah. Their their systems are out of this world. Like they're crazy. Um, but we we use Bentsoft. It's a brilliant software. It's fantastic software. Um, it covers everything. But yeah, a lot of them three PLs are like, oh yeah, we we do this software base and it's brilliant and this mm. is what we, this is what it fixes. It's fucking white labeled. It's not yours. Yeah. Um. But yeah, crazy. So how how do you split your time and manage to run three? Is it so it's all on the one roof, but. How, how is that even structured? Are they four different companies or what? So we have it under two different LTDs. Yeah. Um, uh, so 3PL and Brands or what? Sorry, 3PL and Brands, yeah. 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 Um, Definitely don't do the brands under the same. <laughs> that's, that's <one laughs> yes, that was another here. lesson. Uh, that's getting changed out. Um, but yeah, so um, dispatch staff, they all follow, all pay by e all, is all under the essence fault. Mm. Um, but uh, structured differently, the team structurally is the same. The only part that isn't involved in the three PL is the production side of the business for the essence fault, um, because we still do our, our in house production. Um, so the rest of it is technically they cover the check fulfillment work as well. So customer service, any customer queries, they go through customer service. Uh, we just hired a new head of customer as well, um, which uh, she's a breath of fresh air. Uh, in terms of um, new ways to improve our, our retention customers and stuff, um, which is huge. But uh, generally, it's the only things we've added from the Essence Faults fulfillment to th- the three PL fulfillment is account manager and bear bear software, which has been mm. solved. The rest of it stays the same. And if you had to pick either the brands or the three PL to keep working on now, which one would you choose? And why? Oh, um, the, they are similar. If I choose one, it goes against my dis- diversification well, thing. Yeah, right? but if you have to choose, uh, one. yeah. If I have to choose one, it's going to be three PL. It's going to be three PL because that's so unglamorous and boring to me <laughs> on face value. But I, I'm interested to hear why. It's funny. So all I said something um, was like the best money's made in the boring stuff. He he spoke about. I don't know if it was on the pod, the pod or was it on was it Maybe. in Dubai. He, it's funny he fucking yeah, every agency only would say that wouldn't they all he said I, I remember all you're going to listen to this like but uh, he mentioned he, he was pissed and he said the same story to like four different people it was a company that sold household goods like fairy liquid and stuff yeah. it's like making like fucking 400 million a year he said yeah, the money's in the boring stuff and I sort of applied I was only two weeks ago but I did sort of think and goes, that's why 3B was a great choice because no one else wants to do it Mm. It's boring stuff. No one else. There's, n- you, you know, and I know it. DTC owners are fucking cunts. If we if we're having a bad day, we are our souls. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So no one wants to speak to them angry. But that's that's why there's space in the game. Like cause we are dif- different because I hate saying it. Based on the age, we're going to be different than everyone else. We're going to for- foresee issues. There is going to be less issues to complain about, especially during peak seasons because. First of all, we're brand owners. We know that um, a busy period doesn't just start in November. It's going to creep up. Yeah. We know that um, Q5, as they call it, between Christmas and New yeah. Year is going to be massive uh, for some brands, not all brands. We know to, we know what questions to ask brand owners that um, I was never asked um, at any fulfillment centre we, we visited. Um, and that's why there's space in it, because of that. Because they aren't brand owners. They don't know what brand they, okay, they see their software, they see what's happening. But I guarantee you, over COVID, they fucked they missed all projections all year. Because they never foreseen um DTC making a, a big a big growth period over over COVID. But if you actually spoke to the brand owners, they would have known. Yeah. H- how big do you think three PO can get? A lot bigger than the three brands put together, hundred percent. Like how big? Do you think you can build a billion pound revenue three PL? I think there's more chance of a billion pound three PL and a billion pound brand. Yeah, and are you finding customer acquisition 
like easier or as in compared to e-com and like scale f- does it feel easier to scale because like obviously i mean obviously even 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 in 3pl like i've seen a lot more crop up certainly in the uk in 3pls yeah like there's a lot of money going into x y and z fucking 3pl providers often from like america that are now come into the uk one of which i mentioned before or do you still think there's limited competition compared to the amount of demand? There's very limited competition. Very limited. Because there's a new DTC, DTC brand every week. Every day. Every day. Yeah, um, that's very true. 3PL brands, especially, I'm giving away one of our secrets, especially because of the cost of storage in mainland UK is huge. But in Northern Ireland, it's cheap. It's like a sixth of the cost. Yeah. So that we don't need VC money. It's not what's to live in Northern Ireland. <laughs> it's fucking no, sadly true. Uh, but I don't. We don't need VC money mm. because um, the, the, most of that VC money is going to be put on storage base. So storage base that most of them small three PLs are renting, so they're not getting any benefit from renting more storage space. Whereas we own our storage space, um, and we can continue to grow from there. So we don't have that rental cost that all the all other ones do. Which is one of the points, I don't know if I said it early on in the uh, recording or not, but a lot of the bulk of the cost is paying for storage fees. Yeah. But because we're buying our property and not renting it, we don't have storage fees. If they, if we have more, if we have more brands coming in, they're paying for our mortgage on our storage. That's not something we should be charging for. Yeah, Technically, because it's, it's an asset that, anyway. Yeah, for you. it's an asset for us. Um, yeah. So would you plan to... So obviously what a lot of 3PLs do is, well, especially the bigger ones, they'll have, you know, UK, EU, Amsterdam, often around there, whatever. Yeah. Fucking Australia, Canada and America seems to be the pattern. Yeah. Would you plan on doing that? 100%. Does, does that then defeat the USP of having cheaper storage? Um, yes and no. Um, we'll, still, we'll still offer it because... You're not going to want to work with two, three different three PLs. Yeah, you're going to want to, you're you're going to want to pick up the phone, and speak to one person, who then deals with all your issues. So we will, we will open up to, um, to mainland GS first, um, and sort of go from there. But from a strategic point of view, most of the benefits, most of the positives come from comes from the UK base, because we're like a, we're like a baby US. Like when they speak about high CPMs and stuff, that hasn't really hit UK yet. So we, we benefit from being a year or two behind in the e-com space from the US. So the benefits they had in the golden ages of, of 2019 um, Facebook ads, we, we're still in them, I think, in the UK. So... Yeah, maybe. Yeah, it's harder, definitely harder. But we're still there. Who is your primary customer base then? Like, is there a... I assume it's UK. Yeah, 100% start. UK, yeah. But, like, do you find a particular type of brand... Because... When did you actually launch officially Jack Fulfillment? Which you haven't actually said, by the way, it's Jack Fulfillment. Officially um, launched in November of last year. So it's, yeah, so it's still like, so what, it's, it's a baby, five yeah. months old, yeah. four months old. Um, it's a complete baby, but... Do you find it a challenge signing people up with that? With that, yeah. Without the... Because, I mean, even myself, with the new brand, like, I would instinctively go for what I think is the bigger... Well, you more look reputable at, player. But you look at what happened to you with with Neon Beach. Yeah, you moved to the was it you moved to the UK and sort of yeah that. So it's a very you are trusting someone else with your whole business. Yeah, um, and that's fucking hard. So like our our the the two biggest ones we work with now. I I lost the call. I still call it lost the call. I lost the call on the sales call and left it there. So I, I as a brand owner, I understand their problems or their reasons for not going with us mm. they come back to us three months later because not having signed up elsewhere or what mm-hmm. they signed up elsewhere had the problems and they, they they came to their own judgment of um we're going to get them if, if we get them problems elsewhere anyway we may as well go to you mm. because them problems so so a big thing in 3pl is um as i said before it's like a recruitment agency basically so they hire wrongly in november and december because statistics say that Revenue drops or sales orders drop sixty percent from November to January. Technically, that's not really true across the board. I know the Essence Faults orders only drop thirty percent or something, which is is quite good. Mm. Um, so they're left with thirty percent more orders, 
but 30% less staff yeah so to speak so that meant that them big names not James and James but the other one you mentioned mm. before they failed massively because they let all their staff go and getting them staff back is costly which is something they don't do so I, I heard stories on Twitter two or three people messaged me on uh, on Twitter DM saying yeah yo my customers have, have, have been waiting two weeks on their orders and my yeah. TPL is not replying I've had that issue in the past yeah temporarily do you find so are all your staff typically are they from Northern Ireland or oh yeah yeah yeah. all of our staff is from 20 minutes drive away yeah um, we pay so again based on the recruitment agency thing we pay um, higher the minimum wage um, higher than the because the way it works in the UK the minimum wage is split across ages so the living wage so to speak we pay higher than that mm. to no matter what age they are 16 or 16 between 16 and 25 they all get paid the exact same fee is it generally a younger crowd that you'd be hiring um, no uh, there is it younger ones definitely but it does vary um, it does vary it's very friends and family oriented um, mm. I, everyone says don't hire friends don't hire family about 60% of our staff comes from like it's going to sound inbred like but fuck me uh, yeah. 60% of our staff comes from like six different families so fucking hell yeah, yeah, so like aunties bit. aunties <laughs> <laughs> that's another one's like we yeah, um, no, that's what I've heard. like aunties mums sons daughters they're all working but mm-hmm. that also means that they don't want to let each other down at the same time. So, like, our sick calls are, are extremely low. Our staff turnover, like, we've got 75 staff. Um, Like, four four staff have left in two years. Mm. Like, that's huge. That's massive. Like, that staff turnover is extortionately low. Do you find you get imposter syndrome? Oh, that's massive. Being a young guy managing a very big team, yeah, a hundred percent, hundred percent. I we um, because that's something I've massively struggled with. And I spoke about it a few times, and I've never had that many staff. Because yeah, it probably never even would would be that scared of different business models. But um, yeah, it's, it's something dogs going mad. Something I've struggled with. So like, but yeah, fuck. Especially when I guess. Well, yeah. I mean, have you how have you dealt with that? I find it very hard. That imposter syndrome, it sounds like a cool thing to to talk about, but it is, it is a big thing in business, especially having so much staff. Like my um, chief of operations, um, Jared, he's, oh, he's going to kill me if I say it older than what he actually is. So yeah. let's say he's 50. I'll be nice to you, Jared. Let's say he's 50. Um, like he's my CEO, he's my CEO uh, I call him my CEO. He calls himself my uh, my shit scooper. Um, he deals with a lot of stuff I don't want to deal with. Uh, yeah, like he's a dog. That's me, so. <laughs> Sorry. I don't know. He's uh, he's been brilliant. Um, it is hard disagreeing with him. Yeah. Because ultimately, you, you've got that feeling as <laughs> he's going to be right and I'm going to be wrong. It's purely based on age. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Um, I mean, on the grand scale of things, a lot of our team are very young. Is that because I've got? Is that because I hire with imposter syndrome? Probably without knowing. Yeah, it. because speaking speaking kind of about this literally today in the sauna before we start recording with a flatmate about like it feels kind of easy or more natural to hire people that are younger than you yeah. because like. I guess I don't know societally like biologically whatever like there feels like a kind of hierarchy with age that's kind of what we're brought up with mm-hmm. like respect your elders blah 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 but then if you're the young guy that's the boss particularly in a position where ultimately like a lot of the jobs are relatively low skilled like yeah I don't know I mean this brings me it's on hard to, to speak about it's hard to yeah. speak about it's hard to iterate what you're actually trying to say when you're speaking about imposter syndrome because you tell yourself that it's stupid and you shouldn't have it yeah but that doesn't mean that it goes away um yeah because well, I, another point on that off the back of that I've always found it quite interesting but because I mean you mentioned obviously like 
a lot of you have like fucking families that are working in the jobs and shit and then I've always found it interesting how certain people at a certain age can I mean there's obviously a much wider wider thing in general but like can obviously fucking start a business and obviously there's like 0.0001% of people that be like 25 and like a fucking billionaire or some shit mm. but then you get like I guess the, the bulk of society that fall into like the, kind of the middle and then you get people that work in you know McDonald's or factories yeah. or whatever like it's like super low skill stuff super low paid stuff and I've always wondered like is that an in, is that entirely like is it a lack of skills and because it's like places maybe you're brought up where there's no encouragement to seek new skills obviously it's differently fucking 16 like yeah. I, I, I've had terrible jobs when I was younger and stuff but I always wanted to like as in <laughs> I'm trying to say this without being controversial but like you go to a fucking supermarket and you see a 60 year old bloke stacking shelves yeah, yeah? like I, I've always wondered and there's nothing wrong with that by the way if, if they're happy uh, but like of, often I kind of think like is that their like true potential at that age in their career like do you know what I mean yeah I, I don't know what, what the question is but it's just it's always something I've <laughs> rebel, wondered about like does it come from purely a lack of like genetic potential skill or is it like an environmental or societal Viewpoint. This is one thing I'm I'm, I'm working and I've on. I've completely changed the fucking yeah. subject now to something <laughs> philosophical. But this is one thing I'm working on on myself a wee bit more, um, because I, I sort of look at it my way is the re- the reason why I started the business and the reason why I hired the sort of call it the founder members mm. is because we all hate our old jobs. Okay, so if I hate my old job and my head of dispatch, who's um, again he's fifty five. 60 if he hated his job at 55 and 55 and 60 age maybe isn't a thing is age maybe not really something that matters mm. do you know what I mean and then on the flip side have I just got lucky with my my econ brand at this age I don't know what I'm trying to say I think what I'm trying to say is that I still respect yeah, him yeah, and, yeah. and he, he he respects me as well um I find the whole lucky and... I hate the word lucky. I hate no, it. No, same. But what was it? Because, the, so again, it's what I've been thinking about. Because I put a thing on Instagram. Stop fucking being weird, this dog. <laughs> I'm going to do a Q&A podcast and I've got like 100 questions or whatever. But one of the questions was, and it stuck, stuck out to me because I started thinking about it. It was, why did you and all your mates whatever this guy thinks all my mates are fucking come on from us which is kind of true but like the question was why have you and all your mates managed to scale to seven and eight figures whereas most people don't and it got me thinking oh yeah well I guess most people maybe don't which probably is true but then I was like fuck well I absolutely do not think I've ever got lucky because also by the way one of my fucking brands failed massively which I've been very public about mm-hmm. so it's definitely not I respect luck. that by the way being so public about it yeah, and then it's like, well, I, I, I know I've built successful brands and I fucked that one up and it would have been successful and the next one would be successful. But like, it's never it's never felt like luck. It's felt like just a raw combination of, I, I guess, to be honest, like base talent, I think, which is there in myself and clearly yourself and other, other my other mates that are very successful, particularly some of them. I, I think there's like, there is a genetic base line. I think... But... I think that is very negligible compared to the massively controllable factors of choosing where you're spending your time between the ages of 18 and yeah. 30. Basically. I think it's all that, it boils down to that whole thing. That and you, your environment. That you're based, you are your five closest so people. So fucking true. You are your five closest people. what we people. said at the end of episode yeah. 27 as well. Yeah. Um, I think that's what it boils down to. And I think that's, it's funny because... My group, of, my group of friends, the four of us, um, we all do very different things. Like one of us is an actuary, one of us is in um, banking, and the other is high up in uh, an American pharm- pharmaceutical company. Mm. So we're all in four different massive things. But two of us in particular, every teacher at school would have said, you are going to be a fucking failure. Yeah. And I think because we were, how is this went from imposter syndrome to this? Uh, but That's we went, the interesting parts. We went from being 
not so much not the stereotypical we've always been told that we weren't going to be anything all that shite um, because we were just told them to fuck up mm. because we, we we still knew we were we had our wits about us um, but with that I think imposter syndrome creeps in even more because we weren't we weren't top of our class so why why should we be successful because we weren't we weren't getting A stars we weren't getting A's in economics um you know, we weren't in the, we weren't getting praised for our schoolwork. So why should we? We've we've no right to be successful. Mm. We've no right to be doing well. And I think that's where imposter syndrome sort of comes from because you could, you look at a forty year old um, that's uh, doing very well, uh, say a very rhetorical job, say a plumber, um, making a very good living, um, and we re- the revenue we're generating. I'm not going to say net profit. The revenue we're generating is more than his yearly wage. So we feel, oh, this isn't right. Are we doing something wrong here? Mm. You know, when's the bubble going to burst? And that's when an imposter syndrome creeps in. But I think it goes... The the important thing about this is that it's only you thinking that because the people around you are thinking, fuck, it's not luck. It's not luck. He's not not lucky. I know my management team. Not one of them will think it's lucky. They know the work I put in. I might not be the first in the office. I may not be the first or the last to mm. leave, but they know the work I put in. The risks I take is more than more than enough to, to to prove that I haven't got imposter syndrome. Yeah, but that doesn't mean I don't feel imposter syndrome. I fucking feel it every day. Telling a fifty-five-year-old that they're not doing their job right, or or having to go through a um having to let go of a staff member that you've had since the start. You're thinking, is this the right thing to do? Yeah, I think imposter syndrome, now I'm thinking about it more, is that there's like two parts to it, I guess. There's the day to day, like physically feeling like, oh, I'm telling older, tip, like typically older people what to do as their boss. That's like an element of it that I've struggled with. But the other element, which I probably struggle with less, which is quite interesting, is like thinking you're not, I guess, broadly not deserving of success or like, X, Y, and Z. Whereas, like, even from the age of like twenty one, I started making like money. I guess from like drop shipping at the time and, and like the clothing brand I had with Ollie and shit. Mm-hmm. I always thought, oh fuck yeah, I deserve this because I've been like thinking about this since I was twelve years old. Yeah. Um, I guess there's elements of it. Like, I used to get major imposter syndrome going to car garages because I was always into cars and like yes, I'd very public yes. cars. I'd love stupid cars, blah, blah blah. And like the first time I bought a nice car. I felt really nervous and then I think and, and then when you do it a few times you think oh I'm a fucking baller like this is this is what I do like it becomes normal so like experience it's, it's like the same time the, the, it's like the same shit the first time I flew first class with Emirates which was on points by the way I've never paid for that shit yeah. it's like four years ago all and I was literally like apologising to the fucking hostess because I almost felt guilty her making your bed and stuff yeah, yeah I was like I'm normally I've never done this before yeah, please stand there and I'll do it yeah yeah honestly <laughs> Whereas now I do that and, and like it's, it's cool, but and you appreciate it, whatever. But like, it becomes like normal. And I think the reason for that is experience breeds confidence. And or like, is that the term? Like, there's something I heard, and it's so true. It's so true in so many elements. Because like, and, and it comes back to what you said about average of five people. If all your mates, which is literally true for me, and, and like you said, it's true for you in your own ways. If all your mates are, in my case, running econ brands. Or like most of them are like to fucking yeah. seriously high levels it's like well obviously my next econ brand is going to be a multi-million pound brand mm-hmm. and because I've done it myself before so it's like well of course but if it was my first thing ever then I probably wouldn't even have even if I had the baseline skills is what I'm saying right. I probably wouldn't even have the like mental confidence or belief deep down to even get started which yeah. is what I think the problem is for most people because this is going quite deep now but it's actually fucking interesting because I I got into entrepreneurship and kind of similar for you but slightly different but I never actually went into the proper working world like I had a shit job in Berg but I had all those part time jobs at uni but I dropped out of uni when I had a brand with Ollie and then blah 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 so I never got like why? because I always wanted to drop out and then I built a business to a high enough revenue level where I had enough money to leave and it was like fuck it I'm going all in now but why why didn't you want to pursue your unique course because I knew when I was 10 years old I was an entrepreneur 
Yeah. Like literally. Like, I, I, hate I, knew, word, I hate that word entrepreneur. entrepreneur. Well, so do I, but it's yeah. true. It is, it is. Like what else yeah. is it? Like, I, that is what I am. Yeah. That's what we both are. Um, fucking hell, stupid dog. So like, I knew that, I knew when I was 16 that I wanted to build brands as well. Yeah. Like I was very clear and then obviously you gradually figure it out, whatever. But um, but yeah, like it never even crossed my mind to actually go into like a grad job. Yeah. I mean, obviously when I started uni, I thought, oh, I better figure this out in the next few years. But it was always so clear to me that that's like the broad direction I'd go in. Because I like designing shit and then I figured out like internet marketing and that was kind of it yeah. basically. But I guess because I've, I'd never got kind of corrupted inverted commas by the by like salary yeah by by the salary by the potential group of people that wouldn't have been on the same page had I gone into a certain working world where 99% weren't entrepreneurs say whereas like the second I left uni I didn't know anyone that was an entrepreneur but I went consciously to meet other people that were and now my entire friendship group basically not entire like 90% and network is entrepreneurs yeah. so it becomes normal and then it compounds in itself because that's all you ever know. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I think it's such an interesting thing because there's probably lots of people that I know that you know that are fucking watching that are, or that aren't watching that had like much better genetics than XYZ successful person to potentially build the next major DTC brand, whatever it is, like tech company, fintech, whatever. But because they, I don't know, didn't fucking read a certain book yeah. at a certain time. They got into the wrong crowd in uni, say, or maybe not. Or they went into a grad job where they simply and literally didn't have enough time or resources to pursue what maybe they wanted to do. And because they never pursued it, they never got an idea of the possi- what they could have done. Possibilities, yeah. Like, I, that, that's definitely I'm true. fascinated by that. That's definitely true. I'm, it's just wh- how the world goes. If you don't do it, you never yeah. know. It's one thing that me and my friend group, <laughs> he's digging. Um, one of them in particular, uh, Keon, um me and him would have been the, the worst out of out of the friend group in terms of effort at school, um, w- the teacher's perceptions of us. And it's funny because we look at people that got the four A's and, and A-levels um, and they got to uni, got to a really chemistry degree and all that bullshit. And they're maybe not one. They're not happy. Two. They're not in a job that they thought they were going to be in. It's mm. completing a fucking degree like that, you know. And it, it is. It's true because when I'm hiring, I honestly, I've hired. I say, going to say it properly, um, six times. I have not once looked at any of their school results, any of their university results. I couldn't tell you what the two new hires done at uni. I don't even know if they went to uni. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So, so what are you hiring them based on? Based on their experience, based yeah. on, not honestly, based on their interview, based on how they speak to me. Yeah, one I guy, think experience and personality. One guy um, Massive. was a fantastic salesperson. I didn't hire him because he kept staring at my operations manager when I was speaking, and that was because he was older than me. He kept staring at him, responded to him when I was asking the questions. And I, he was the only candidate until then. And after that, I went, no, I'm not hiring you. You completely have disrespected me in terms of, you know, how can I be your boss? And I'm, ne- I'm, I'm no one's boss at, 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 in my businesses. But he's just completely disrespected me because he has a problem with having a younger manager. Mm. Manager, I hate them words, manager, boss, and that bullshit. Yeah. Um, but... And so, and I hired the next person was Melissa, and she was fantastic. No sales, very little sales experience, but was very bubbly. Exactly what I would want on a sales call. Um, I couldn't tell you what she did at school. I can tell you her. <laughs> I can't even tell you her last job. She was a project manager in construction trade. Um, but it was more based on her personality. And I think that's I think that's why in ten years time, imposter syndrome is not going to be a thing because everyone's going to realise that no one cares about your university degree unless obviously you're a fucking doctor yeah, or in that sort of field um, no one's going to care about that and it's going to go away so to speak um, but yeah but right now massive imposter syndrome because I haven't got I've got a fucking pass and a criminal justice degree 
I haven't got a degree. If I have, to, if I had to go for another job, I'm not getting it. Do you know what I mean? If I'm going for a job, you someone don't done have it on to Twitter. Do. Someone done it on Twitter. You're in. You've escaped the matrix. I know, but someone's done it on Twitter. There's no way you can go back. Someone's done it on Twitter where they were a CEO. They are a CEO of a like a billion dollar company, and they went for five interviews. I actually think one of them was at their own company. They didn't get it. That's so interesting. With their C, with their CV, mm. like that's mad. That's the reason why imposter syndrome is a thing. Yeah, so, I mean, f- fucking hell, we could go on about imposter syndrome and a million more philosophical things for f- three hours, which we always end up doing in this podcast, especially combined with good red wine. But what did I want to come on to? Um, I suppose one thing I do ask, I think it's quite interesting, especially for people that, like, were going down a bit more of a traditional route and then fucking ended up changing into entrepreneurship. Like... How do you think your life and perception of the world is different? Well, it, that's not a good question. That's too ambiguous. Like, how do you think experiencing like elements of financial success in terms of obviously growing fucking businesses, being able to hire a lot of people, especially at a young age, has changed? I mean, I don't think you're into like, you're into like fancy cars and shit or what like I mean is, is there any of that like oh, I was that fucking idiot that the second I got any money I was like oh fuck I want to do everything that I dreamt about doing when I was 12 years old and I've done most of that and then it becomes different things obviously and I was never that sensible but yeah. I'm always interested to hear other people's perspectives because it seems like most people that are on this podcast are way more sensible than me <laughs> and like yeah I, I guess broadly the question is like how is that changed anything if it has and I don't know I think it's two things part of it is the do you know the old thing that well the thing they say in crypto was like you're not uh, you're not at a loss until you sell yeah I think that's with me and and the brands I don't feel successful until the brands are done does that make sense so, so on the yeah you're saying you're not at a profit until you sell kind of I wouldn't like I wouldn't even class myself as successful yeah. Um, obviously, getting away from imposter syndrome, that probably is part of imposter syndrome. Like, for example, I do drive a nice car, a Tesla Model 3. Uh, I want to get a pink one of them. Just somewhere, I'll actually. be fucking class for space goods. That's why I want to get a pink one. Yeah. Um, plus, the, to be honest, only reason I got it was the tax rate off. Yeah, for that's also why I want to get one. I've got a bit more sensible. <laughs> um, yeah, that's the, that's the reason why I got it. Um, I think that, that goes back to imposter syndrome where... I don't want to drive a nice car because mm. all, all our staff's in the one warehouse. Yeah, you know, I would love to drive a Lamborghini Urus. Yeah, I would. That's my fucking dream car. My I, want, I want to get a pink one. Yeah, then. bright pink one. Be fucking it. class. Um, my skincare brand's based on like a purple, and yeah. I would love a purple one. But by the same thing, what are they going to think of me? What are they going to think of me if I do mm. that? And yeah, it's funny because everyone says, "Oh, like it's wrapped like a matte grey." My Tesla and. I love it, like, but people... Ray, just, come on, get yeah. baby blue or something. <laughs> Maybe. But instantly, as soon as anyone asks me about it, I, I, I actually say, yeah, it's a tax write-off, don't worry. Why am I saying that? I don't know. Yeah. Because you, you, like, you feel like you have to justify what yeah. people might view as extortionate. Yeah. I think or that is lavish it. or whatever they want to say. I think that is it. Um, I mean, I, I help, like, I we've um, sort of provided loans for a lot of like six or seven members of staff that have been going through hardship especially now because of the fucking energy crisis and Mm. if someone asked me if someone was a baller and I had just bought a fucking Lamborghini Urus and I couldn't support them even though that's not what a business owner is supposed to do yeah I would still feel bad yeah um I think that comes with maturity doesn't it to an extent I mean definitely like but the difference in my mindset even just from 24 to 26 it's quite stark to be fair yeah. i think that's probably what happens when you have a taste of success and then have a taste of potentially losing a lot of it and then humbles you yeah yeah and you yeah probably it's, get a more bulletproof perception on a lot of things that's that whole thing where they say that the meal is it meal or just people in general they finally grow up at 25 at 25 yeah fucking hell like my dad's been telling me f- since I was 15 that my brain would be fully formed at 25 <laughs> and I swear to god yeah when I passed 25 like something felt a bit different and it coincided with me fucking going through hell as an entrepreneur but yeah it definitely 
felt like I came out like more wise and woke and shit. Yeah. It's funny because that's still one of your stuff. Uh, uh, yeah, fucking right. And that's the angle. Um, back when we nearly went bankrupt, that's when I turned twenty five. So looking back on it, that's when I sort of stopped chasing the short five screenshots. Yeah, and started going after net profit. Yeah, so on that, Dogs to dog, dog, dog. sleep on my shoulder. Fuck, you know, I have to clip this, put it on Instagram. Um, on that, we mentioned it earlier. I think there's definitely an epidemic of, firstly, well, not an epidemic, but like in the very niche world, that I guess we are in relatively. Firstly, people only sharing the front end of any econ yeah. business because probably their back end doesn't exist or they're fronting and just full of shit. Or just like chasing, well, I guess kind of the same thing, but chasing those big revenue screenshots, which everyone's guilty of at some point. I've yeah. done it. And then not really having any regard for like profit or Absolutely. sustainability. Absolutely. And, you know, all that less glamorous stuff. It's funny because I, I think triple whales changed the game there because pardon me um, beforehand your net profit mar- your net profit amount was never finite Do you know, you're working out your cogs based on your average um, skew yeah. rather than your actual skew yeah. so there are, people can be like oh I can't share my net profit because that's not exactly right with mm. triple whale I feel like I'm a triple whale rep now um, yeah I'm just like using that <laughs> With them. Only time when they're going to sponsor the podcast for like five grand a month, I was like, mm, <laughs> open to it. Buy triple wheel. Yeah. Um, now your net profit amount per day is to the penny. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So now I think the next wave of Shopify screenshots are going to be triple wheels screenshots. They're going to be exact. Okay, you can fake them 100%. You can just leave your cogs out for fuck's sake. Hmm. But your net profit's your net profit. It's an actual finite number now. Um, and I know there was stuff like you could do your oh bring everything in through Supermetrics and have this fucking dash this Excel sheet yeah, but I it was never so. right mine was never right no it wasn't yeah like on that whole profit versus fucking valuation blah 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 stuff broadly speaking and then particularly to e-com like my, my view on that has developed over time like I mean obviously when you're getting started like in a fucking bedroom you literally have to be profitable otherwise yeah. you're fucked in about a month or a week or two days if you and me would like starting with like literally 50 quid but now I guess I mean I've had obviously guys that sold SaaS businesses and made a lot of money like eight figures from selling non-profitable businesses like yeah. go watch episode 22 and then we've had Jimmy on that sold for a large, very large amount <laughs> with a profitable business, but I wonder, like, how, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just interested because I, I guess my goal with building a brand financially, it, even from like way back in time when I was starting and when I was like 19, was like, oh, I can build a brand and get a big exit because that's where you really get paid. Because I, like, even as a brand owner, say you're hypothetically making a million quid, EBITDA. Mm you're not even fucking realising that personally, which again, is something yeah. that people that aren't in the game don't fucking talk about or realise or empathise with at all. It's like, revenue isn't in your it isn't in your pocket. Net profit would be, but even then, it's not yours, it's the businesses and obviously you have to fund stock, fucking staff, growth, whatever. Yeah. So like, to, to me, it's always been, I don't really give a shit about making money until I can sell the business, but obviously there needs to be financials and mechanics and growth, whatever that put it in a position to sell it. And obviously I've not got mm-hmm. that 100 million quid exit yet, but I, that's still the goal. Do, in you, fact, do you think million that's the goal? Do you think that's the goal? For me. Would you be happy after you've... How long... Sorry, let me reword that. How long would you be happy for after an exit? Because I don't last a two-week holiday. As in what? As in would I want the next thing or would I just not be satisfied after that? Bored. Yeah, so I mean... Again, this is an interesting one because I think I tweeted about this the other day, like a month ago. So something was on my mind on a flight. I was like, hypothetically, if you had a billion pounds tomorrow, just got injected uh-huh. into your bank account, what would you work on? Because you, you want to do something. Yeah. And it's like kind of a jarring question for everyone in the world because I feel like the answer to that question is what you should work on now. Yeah. And I, I, I say that like I'm fucking wise and shit, but I'm not. I'm still <laughs> figuring it out. But that's just the way I think about it. And then I'm like, fuck, the shit I'm actually doing now is actually 
probably pretty fucking close to what I would do if I had a billion quid in my bank account tomorrow. Yeah. The difference would be, yeah, I'd have like a fucking Bugatti Chiron <laughs> and 15 Cullinans. But even that would probably be boring after a while. So yeah, to answer your question more specifically, I mean, it's always been a, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I've not done it yet, but I, I would like to think, I've always said to myself, it'd be nice to be fucking done financially by 30. And I think that's realistic. As in like never have to think about money to any capacity ever again. Which by the way, I think is less money than people think anyway. Yeah. I think yeah. five, three to five million does that. You mentioned it before, you thought it used to be a hundred million. I mean, I everyone says a hundred million it's a nice round number. Yeah. Cause it sounds like more than 10 million, but not a billion because that's yeah. stupid. Like, <laughs> I mean, so yeah, but I don't know. I, I guess it would be nice to have that big Champions League exit, as I called it in another podcast. And be like, I don't know, have some fucking sick recognition for something cool I'd built. But at the same time, be in a position to either keep working on that mission or the know. next business. I don't know. I, think I don't I, know. I'm, I'm throwing out things that haven't happened yet, but... Yeah. It's very it's very um, theoretical. But like, the one thing, if you ask me, would I be happy with if someone offered you... Um, someone did offer me multi-million um, for the brand. It was It was literally a fucking... Saudi prints from LinkedIn, like so yeah, I, I yeah, take it with yeah. a grain of salt. Um, but uh, someone did offer me, and it prompted it was actually with Joe. Um, we we spoke about it, and uh, he said it was would 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 you have, would you have taken it if it was real? If they had suitcases full of money, would you mm. have taken it? I don't think I would have. It, it, and the big thing was was because we went in our me and my missus went in our honeymoon to New York um, over New Year. Had a, a fucking fantastic time. Didn't really worry about work. But see, on day nine and ten, I was itching to yeah. get back. To get back. That's when, when you know it's real. That's when you know, yeah. You are here, you think fucking, you are. Yeah. That Drake lyric. But I think if I sold, I would last two weeks. And if I sold, yeah, I feel my that. next band might not be profitable. So would I want mm. to? I, I would. If I, get, if I fucking sold for 100 million, I reckon I'd burn through 98 of that finding a profitable business yeah. it's one of them ones um, if you give yourself 10 days to clean a room it would take you 10 days yeah. uh, whereas it's so interesting because, I mean yeah I guess the baseline is just I'd like to make fuck you money which whatever flippantly like 10 million plus yeah. probably is that you know I'd like to do that by like 30 and I think I will because I guess what would I do with that? I mean, it would mean I never have to worry about money. Not that I worry about money anyway, to be honest, but like I would literally never have to worry about money because I wouldn't ever have to do anything ever again. Yeah. And I could fucking help my parents out, whatever, blah, blah, blah. But beyond that, and I still think it's the most important thing, and I've thought about it so much, like I genuinely do believe I care more about, I actually just want to achieve something great before I die. Yeah. I just I really feel that. And like... I'm not just saying that for like fucking oh, yeah. shivers down this behind or whatever. Stuff, I just yeah. actually feel that like I want to do something cool and be respected for doing <laughs> doing something. <laughs> there he is barking. <laughs> just as I was saying some epic. I have to chop <laughs> a little bit out. <laughs> right into the mic. Um, <laughs> what was I saying? Yeah, I want to do something cool, but also, and I, I feel like what I'm working on now, and I've not even fucking launched it yet. So Jesus Christ, but. It's, it's something cool that I enjoy creatively that I think can have a massive impact on an industry and be a fucking great business. If I, if someone then gave me a hundred million quid for it, that's even better. Yeah. Two, two things. It's, for me, the dopamine hit is different because for the bigger brand, um, a really, really good day on the big brand would mean less to me than a 500 pound day on skincare yeah it's strange and, and it's very very strange because obviously the bigger brand at the bigger amount makes me more money but why do I care about the skincare brand making what in the grand scheme of things is a very little amount of money mm. um, I think that it's all about dopamine hits with that one and secondly I think might, progress is key to happiness progress, in life yeah, I yeah. Think that's where that comes from yeah zero to yeah, 100 pounds feels better than 10,000 to 15,000 pounds right yeah hypothetically no, you've, you've nailed it in the head there second yeah. of all best achievement you mentioned about parents there was buying my father um, 
a Jeep, a ja- uh, Jaguar FPS, is it? Bought mm. one of them, and he fucking the look on his face when we, when I gave it to him was massive. That meant more than any uh, Shopify number, triple wheel number, mm. anything at all. That's weird. Um, that was my that was my moment where I pinched myself and I thought, right, what I'm doing is actually changing things. Do you know what I mean? It's not just for me. It's not just money in the bank or it's not... I don't actually have that much money in the bank, to be honest. I fucking reinvest it. Mm. Um, but that's where it's... Actually, I thought, right, we're on the right path here. Um, sort of thing. Which changed changed the way I thought. That was... That was um, that was back when we were near bankrupt, which was obviously a fucking stupid move at the time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but... That's what made you near bankrupt. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck imagine do you hear that dad um, no uh, that was one thing that uh, it was the motivation more because alright I can get this fucking dopamine hit from that okay it was a fucking cheap for him but it was a fucking dopamine hit for me it was a progression hit for me mm. do you know what I mean yeah it's the sort of thing where you give money to the homeless person you feel better for them than they do they do yeah I strongly think that um, another one of them was um, a little girl uh, called Abby um, she had uh, got cancer age 13 um, 12, 13 um, sorry Sam if I got that wrong um, we released a signature fragrance um, called Abby um, she picked the scent herself um, what it smelled like uh, everything we designed the label the label was her signature and we raised a lot of money for her that was also a massive dopamine hit mm. um, it really helped them financially um, but it was a dopamine hit for me as well. I, I say dopamine hit vaguely. Um, yeah, it was a motivation for me mm. because I looked at it as if to say, right, how many more people can we help, so to speak? Um, because the me- some of the messages her mum Sam has sent me really pushes me through hard times in a business, and you do get hard times, even when it's going good. It's fucking mm. hard. Yeah. Um, where it could be fucking a Facebook campaign that you you plow thousands into the creative it just flops and you have to turn off like that's fucking it's tough but um, them sort of progression hits progression points as you call them um, change things yeah completely agree yeah I feel like that this is something I was debating with a family member recently it's been a fucking argument it's always been something we debated but like I feel like a lot of people think like money is evil or like like pursuing wealth of any sort is bad I don't know where this comes from it, oh, it's, yeah, it's often, all, it's often by the way champagne socialists which run that narrative when they fucking grew up in a three million pound Surrey house but didn't know how much the mortgage <laughs> cost you know what I mean but but the way I see it is like ultimately like to give a layman's terms example like if there's a I don't know fucking person in a classroom teaching one kid how to speak French right they're impacting one person but if you then put a million quid of ads behind like a course that that teacher made and they go viral on YouTube and a million kids learn from it they've had more impact as a result of capital yeah Mm -hmm. so that's that's why I that's why I think bigger is better in terms of like money that you make personally and how big a business can be because ultimately money it just means like you've impacted in some way hopefully yeah. positively more people and then you've had a bigger dent in the universe yeah to quote Steve Jobs yeah uh, so I, I find it interesting when people think like money is evil and shit but it's like broadly speaking like if there's more money involved in a project or business whatever person it gives you more resource to have an impact and if you've got a bigger business you are affecting more people yeah. so if people are buying your products they obviously fucking like the product yeah, definitely. So it's almost like a like you're solving like it's a, a noble pursuit. Yeah, as well, it is to scale um, something. It is, especially opinion. when you do it individually like that. That we girls, Abby and her mother Sam, they went through a fucking tough time, and no one that I had the ability to help them. Um, Sam will disagree, but it meant a lot more to me than it did them. Mm. Um, because it meant so much to me that I had what I was doing was beneficial to someone. It's obviously beneficial to me, my family. Blah, blah blah, but no one that I affected someone that I had no notion of, no idea of, um, apart from a, a gorgeous ticket, mm. um, gorgeous ticket coming through customer service about this little girl who had cancer. Oh, yeah. Um, that was fucking massive. 
that was life changing for me to be honest that was a point where I thought right let's how can we do this again mm. um, I still speak to her every day uh, as well which is nice um, she just rang her bell on getting clear of cancer oh sick um, fucking she uh, got about to ring her bell and she got covered um, the week that happened was fucking mad, but uh, thankfully she's all right. She's she's all good, um, all clear of cancer, which is amazing. Um, but yeah, the the whole capital is, capitalistic thing is wrong. It's fucking bullshit. Mm, yeah, completely, completely agree. It's bullshit. What's the plan over the next three to five years then? Three so to five do, years. Do you have a plan that far ahead, and where do you see? the mix of businesses and yourself going but the mix of between me and my businesses well as in like do you think you'll be involved in the three brands as well as the 3PL in three five years time and you know if yes or no like um, where do you want to take them it's funny I, I hate when people say that you know when when you're speaking to like finance people where do you see the brand in five years I don't see I'm the brand definitely not finance I don't <laughs> fucking see the brand anywhere more than five weeks time to be yeah, honest facts. yeah um, the, the whole business plan bullshit do you know what you need to yeah, do a business Jesus plan? Christ, don't get me started on that. Um, things, the first thing I say to that is things change every day, so there's no point thinking about it. Second of all, um, to answer it more... I guess where would you like to be? Is where would I like to be? Um, What's the plan? At the minute, broadly. the SS Vault takes up about 90% of revenue. I would love that split at least, at least 50-50 between the three brands and the three PL. Hmm. Um, more so because the 3PL is more consistent. Um, no brand wants to leave a 3PL because of the cost associated to getting your stock out, getting into a new um, 3PL. So um, we would love a, a little bit more consistency um, and sort of growing that. Um, and we're, we're not looking for massive brands with the 3PL. I want to for, sort of focus on people that are just about to leave their garage um, yeah. to getting onto the sort of big bad world of uh, econ because at that stage it's life changing um, mm. I would love to have had someone like that when I was leaving my bedroom to get in a, an office if I had someone more so Ollie speaks about it quite a lot about how his people are outsourced CMOs I would mm. love that with our 3PL so you know, we could turn around and say okay because it benefits both of us it benefits both of us if someone's doing 50 orders a day I want them to get to 500 orders because it fucking makes me more money Yeah, do you know what I mean so th- taking a leaf out of Ollie's book in terms of the outsourced CMOs, um, my account managers can speak to that client, okay, this is this is who to go to. Okay, so um, tell me your problems. My AOV is fucks. My AOV is shit. My ROAS on TikTok is shit. Mm. Okay, I'll give you a CRO agency. I'll give you a, um, a TikTok agency. Here's your problem solved. Done. Um, I, I don't have money to, to pay for my next stock run. Okay, I'll give you a number at Wayflower. Yeah, I'll fix that. Um, that makes me more money in the in the end, but it also grows them. That's why I want to get to there because I'm affecting other brands. Mm. I, I'm affecting other brands that are therefore affecting other people. Yeah, and let's not forget about the capitalist point. I want to make more money as well. <laughs> Do you know yeah. what I mean? Um, it's never a bad thing. It's never a bad. It's not a bad thing. Um, but yeah, what about yourself? Do you see yourself all in on space goods or what in three to five years? Yeah. I think in five years, I'd like to have made 30 million plus from the brand. Yeah. Which I know to 99% of people sounds ludicrous, but I thought I'd have made 10 million quid by now from Neon Beach. So I honestly did. I'd like private equity. Before it went wrong, I had meetings with big PE house and shit. It was getting serious. And then that all went to shit. But I mean, yeah, like, I think just. I, I do think this is the one for me like, in terms of brands so everyone fucking says that in it but like, I've never been as excited by a brand in terms of like if I'm right in terms of my vision for the psychedelic renaissance as I fucking call it then I actually think it's a billion pound brand I don't think it's a hundred million pound brand it's funny because we spoke on Twitter DMs ages ago about the, the idea of the brand and yeah. I, I personally think it's a year too early but see the fucking infectious um, infectiousness of the way you're talking about it covers that year well yeah so I know it's very early for like psychedelics and shit but obviously like and, and, and this is why I need to do another podcast about the brand specifically the way I'm positioning it is is that bridge 
I mean, it's not a psychedelic, right? The yeah. fucking first product is not a class A drug. Newsflash. <laughs> the amount of people that have messaged me saying, oh, for my first time trying psychedelics. And that's that probably going to be a problem with the market <laughs> angle. But it's not. The way I'm positioning it, it's ultimately a powerful, it's a fucking great quality nootropic adaptogen mushroom blend, which exists on the market already. Similar stuff exists. The difference is, my branding's fucking way better than everyone else's. In my, I just honestly think that. The backstory to the brand is way better, and I want it to have personality. And like, the, we're doing a mad video shoot tomorrow, which is actually just ridiculous. It's just very well, that's cool. That's the one with the mark and stuff, isn't it? Yeah, 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 it's just very cool, and it's it's an opportunity for me to just make movies, which I used to want. I mean, Jack told me this before. Like, I wanted to be a fucking film director when I was like ten years old. So, it's a very creative brand. So that's why I'm very excited about it from a personal standpoint. Yeah, but that's infectious. That's infectious. Yeah. And then. What was I saying? Um, I, I guess the difference in the way I'm positioning it, which is going to get me in trouble probably, but I hope the Daily Mail write, write, writes an article on me saying that I'm a fucking scam artist this time because <laughs> because it, it's not true and it'll be good PR. But like, well, I'm positioning scam, the, the product now back, as a, the best legal alternative to what we would like to make but can't yet. Yeah. And... Yeah, I'm just fucking excited by it because ultimately right now, I guess it's a glorified supplement brand. That is ultimately what version one is because that's all it can be legally because again, newsflash, you can't fucking sell class A drugs online and, yet. and build a yet. business. Yet. When they're not class A drugs and they're legalised, which a lot of what I think will happen because by the way, there's billion, literally billion pound public companies like Compass Pathways, Atai Life Sciences, all this bullshit which are like science companies yeah. that are doing research on this into like psilocybin and XYZ psychedelics being fucking like key to curing humanity of like mass depression because of social media and shit um, but the problem with those companies is there's no product yet they're like and 10 no... year pathways to build something so I'm building a consumer brand that's ready for a market that I believe will be happening in the next few years but isn't quite there yet so in the meantime this is the best we can do mm -hmm. Our brand's fucking way better than everyone else's. Everyone knows it is. And that's it. That's the vision, right? Uh, I personally, I think I think the brand's going to be fucking amazing. Like, more so because of the actual world we're living in now, which is where TikTok Organic is a massive part of that. Mm. I think it's a very TikTokable brand. Yeah. Uh, and I also think it just comes down to... I hope I'm not deluded, but I've got a lot of experience now building brands and I know yeah. not, I know what not to do. And like, Christ, I've been doing it like seven years and haven't quite cracked it. Like I've obviously, I've scaled brands. One that one I'm not interested in that was fine and one that I was really passionate about that fucked up. And yeah, I just, I, I, I feel like the stars are aligning in terms of the market, my, my interests, my creative passion, timing in terms of, you know, I'm a strong believer of everything happens for a reason. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll be it. You don't like to hear it at the time. I'm sure fucking you heard it when Neon Beach went up. Everyone's going to go, oh, yeah, now, now for it's, it's, yeah, it's one of those things that it's starting to make sense looking back. But like, honestly, like this time last year, I was in a fucking hole. Yeah. I can remember. It was almost to the week where like everything officially went fucked. Mm -hmm. I was I, like a stone heavier, probably more looking back. <laughs> like it was not in a good place. Yeah. Like I, I know, I know, I was bad at that period where we had in our business where we were nearly bankrupt, and I know how bad I felt then. Mm. So I can only imagine fucking what happened with you. Like it's night and day. Yeah. Um, but that's a motivation at the end of it as well. You're fucking balls deep in space goods because of it. Yeah, I have the world's biggest chip on my shoulder, mm. and I always. And did that's not a bad thing. Way started, it but now it's big. It's almost like a, I don't know who, who the chip is towards, but it's towards just the fucking. Like, if I'm not, like, I just, it's like, fuck, if I can bounce back and do it from, like, actual, what I felt like was, like, borderline fucking wanting to kill myself, rock bottom. Yeah. Then it's just going to be the greatest story of all time in, like, the e-com space. I just truly feel that. Yeah. And, yeah, I just, I don't know, I just, I just feel pretty dangerous right now. Cause, like, cause I, don't, I don't feel like I have anything to lose. Yeah. Like, it's like, fucking, come on, like, it can't get any worse than it did last year exactly. ever mm. in my mind aside from health problems or whatever but entrepreneurially it's like fuck like I'm pretty dangerous because I, I know 
I'm good enough, but I know I also have the right people around me and I have great investors now. Jack, who's the founder of Wayfly, is one of them. He's the biggest investor, by the way. I was trying to get him on the fucking podcast. Um, and people like that, which I'm very fortunate to know. So, like, f- funding's never a problem. Yeah. Is it... Well, because... And I spoke about this as well. I don't want to go on too much of a tangent, but I, I went down the fundraising route very intentionally, which I spoke a bit about on Twitter and the podcast, so yeah. I'll say it again. But, like, I, I want to strategically inflate the value of this brand as much as possible yeah and give you um, also build a great brand yeah. but I don't want it to be a bedroom brand mm. I want it to be how can we fucking IPO this in five years yeah cool that's the it. way I'm trying to think about be it be with the bear 3PO yeah exactly well that's what I said <laughs> but um yeah anyway enough about that because I'm going to do a QA and a episode in it and we've gone like fucking nearly two hours but um yeah it's interesting so, last question before we wrap up and we could probably go down a million rabbit holes that we haven't covered but I think it's been a good episode um, I've started asking this to every guest now it's a bit cringe but if you could give three bits of three advice bits to yourself yeah. you've, you know it's, um, it's going to become a signature to when you first started which I guess I don't know a few years ago for you brought, like you know just three bits covering everything what would they be? <sighs> I'm going to take longer to answer this than the hairbrush guy <laughs> Yeah, but uh, first one definitely, and it's the biggest one is stop worrying. Um, that's a big one for me. It's that pes- pessimism X, um, imposter syndrome X. You don't deserve it. You're too young, sort of thing. Just don't worry. Just fucking go balls deep. Just do do whatever you think. Do whatever suits you. Mm. Um, because that's what you're going to have mo- the most motivation for. That's what you're going to push the most. That's what you're going to succeed in. Because I've had some shit times with my brands. I've pushed through them because one, we have the staff in there where I can't have a bad day. Because if I have a bad day, th- they could be at work, or a bad week, or a bad month, whatever. Um, number two, be in the best room you can be in. Go and buy that you're the five your five closest people mm. sort of thing you're a combination of them be in them make sure them five are the fucking best ones you can be um, one of my big sounds fucking cheesy as fuck one of my biggest inspirations has been my father um, my mum had multiple cirrhosis died last year um, how he handled that how he handled her being sick was massive for me so absorb as much as possible absorb the good things and the bad things from fucking everyone mm. um, but at the end of the day make sure them five people are fucking strong people um, I think my five I wouldn't change my five for the world I think my five are are top quality mm. um, definitely number three is a hard one um, number three is definitely a hard one <sighs> what's your three have you been asked that before have that actually you fucking out. my three Christ I think on the spot um, it's quite hard isn't it and uh-huh. uh, my three going back to when I was like 17 probably when I started I think one thing I wish I'd done a bit more was focus on one thing although I think that's in itself almost bad advice because I'm probably ADHD and like I think I'd have to do a lot of things to figure out what I was doing. But I think I, I often, my only regret if there was any was I wish I'd focused on one thing earlier or someone had forced me to focus on one thing earlier, i.e. one brand, because by now it could have been a fucking hundred million pound brand. Mm. So that, that's maybe one thing. Um, I guess, yeah, that, that'd be the first. Um, second one's going to be fucking a bit wet, but it's so true. Like, don't chase girls and get caught up in in don't get thrown off the path by people that aren't going to be there when you fucking properly make it. Yeah. And like, and it sounds silly, but everyone watching the pod knows what, what I'm talking about and alluding <laughs> to. And like, it's not just been that girl, but like, you know, I'm very guilty of getting overly romantic and overly yeah. involved in certain social situations that weren't a reflection of like my reality and so on. So I, th- I think that's big, like stay on the fucking war path and prioritise yourself and and the good blokes around you if you're a guy I mean typically that's the case um, in, in this audience at least and I guess thirdly 
I think uh, the one that just sprung to mind there's probably 20 I could give but like don't take advice from people that haven't done what you're trying to do yeah I think it's huge. like massively controversial which it shouldn't be but like do not fucking listen to a uni lecturer and I had one by the way who tells you that something's too risky when they're in a 30 grand year a 30 grand a year job they hate I'd always I'll always remember my P- have, you, have you got PSE over here? PSE no, no? Um, learning for life and work it was a fucking stupid GCSE class yeah and she asked around the room what do you want to be when you're older and I said a millionaire she laughed in my face but, I mean even including your own parents though yeah don't listen to them oh, yeah. they haven't done what you want to do which is a hard one by the way my, it has my been dad, hard one for my me. dad he laughed at me when I when I walked in with my first perfume bottle he fucking laughed at me he'll laugh at me he, he did laugh at something me right. uh, and they laugh at you he laughed at me did, did, did he still support me yes um, he gave me a thousand pound loan to start um, but he laughed at me while mm-hmm. doing it he thought fuck I'm not seeing this money again um, yeah. but he still done it he still supported me um, but yeah I totally agree there massive my one, my third thing on it is your support uh, edges between the five great five bit closest people again two or sorry three your partner if you don't have a supportive partner don't have one yeah I, I've opened my laptop at 11 o'clock at night and sh- um, my missus is bitched in my ear but I can just say like, fuck I need to do it I don't, I ne- I don't need to do it but I, it's what I want to do at that time and she's yeah. supported that probably hasn't supported it in the, at the moment at that moment but she understands mm. um, she understands I'm grateful for that yeah but we don't tell her that to be honest hope she's never never listens to this so don't have to Watch that whole thing. Yeah, edit that out. Really. Um, but yeah, if you don't have a supportive partner, don't have one. Yeah, I agree um, completely. I know a few big people like Danny Buck and stuff has, has put a lot of his work down to his his misses. Hmm. But I'm going to go one step further and say, if you don't have a supportive partner, don't have one at all. Just fucking get rid. Yeah, um, I agree. We don't need to do it. If you've got the perfect metric between having a supportive partner and not fucking going out chasing birds every night. Um, taking coke and fucking all that stuff uh, you're going to be okay yeah um, you're going to be okay but if you, there's nothing worse than a fucking having a partner that doesn't support you um, yeah definitely because they can put you off it very quick mm. my my ex would have been happy at me in a five to, or a nine to five third egg a year that's what I was looking at with her I got out of there real quick. I didn't actually go out of there. It fucking lasted five years. But eventually I got out of there. Yeah, no, I feel that, I feel that. Yeah, fucking, yeah, you made me answer three quite, so I could have answered better, but there we go, um, on the spot. Fuck, that's been like bang on two hours nearly. Um, fucking very hell. interesting chat. I think, we, we, again, as always, I thought we said we could do fucking three hours. The, the more wine we had, the more hours we could do. That's how it always is. Um, that was fucking interesting one. Very varied, very, very varied. Um, I hope that was interesting to, to listeners, watchers, whatever. As usual, weekly episodes. Even when I don't feel like doing episodes is, at the minute, I'm fucking doing them because I get messages every day, people telling me the shit changes their life. It's like <laughs> it's kind of like you were saying, like it gives you purpose and shit. It's actually quite powerful. Um, yeah, if you like the pod, subscribe, recommend it to a friend, all that good shit. And yeah, cheers for watching. We'll fucking see. push your course. We'll, we'll see you on the next push one. Push your course a bit more. That's in the fucking promos. Yeah, fucking keep 11 going. minutes in. Uh, oh, is it? Uh? Yeah, Christ. I, I plug that in every time. Uh, I don't do it in the pod. It's like aftermarket. I, uh, I, I'll bought, start plugging in space as well. I bought it for, for my missus. She wants to start a Nikon brand. Oh, really? She found it fucking very good. Oh, um, sick. Okay. Uh, very good. Yeah, buy the fucking course. I almost forget I have that, to be honest. Um, Affiliate code is Connor. <laughs> yeah. One, two, it, three. It, yeah, no, it's, it's already fucking, it's already in like 11 minutes in, but um, yeah, cheers for watching. See you in the next one. Yeah.